Well, I have here in my hand a, a coffee mug, and it's not just any old mug. It's a handmade ceramic mug. I know the, the guy who made this mug. He's a very godly man. He's a, a minister, and uh, he, he made this for us, really. And, and when I think about it, it's, it's a very special one. It has the dove here. You know, it's got a scripture on it. It's just, it's just really nice. And, and you can see it's very clean and very shiny. And in fact, I'm, I'm even, as we're here, polishing it up just a bit to make sure that it looks really, really nice uh, for you. And there's not a spot or a speck that I can see um, on it there, and I think you would agree it's a very special mug. Um, now, based on what you see here um, and what I've said about it, would you be willing to drink water or coffee or something else from this cup? You might say, well, Scott, I know you a little better than that. There's probably a trick, right? There's something that you're not telling us. Well, there is something I'm not telling you, which is on the way in, I stopped and I, I filled it with dirt. Um, I, it's basically... Um, out here um, in the front, I got some, I think there's a dead bug in there even. I'll make sure that I wash it really clean, but it's, it's actually pretty nasty inside. And so most of you, again, on almost anything would want to know both sides of the story, right? You'd want to know the, the inside story as well as the outside story. And I titled today's talk out of Mark chapter 7, The Inside Insight. Right, the inside insight, because, again, anyone who thinks things through, you don't just want to look at a carefully cleaned exterior of a cup. You want to see what's inside it before you decide, well, yes, that's something that I would trust. That's something that I would do, uh, you know, is actually drink from that. And, again, just that simple perspective of, of tilting or turning it in such a way that you can see, wow, there's quite a distinction, there's quite a difference between this pretty almost perfect outside and the not so pretty inside. And just because I polished it to perfection on the outside doesn't mean much if it's a muddy mess on the inside. And I would venture to say, again, that nobody would just drink from a cup no matter how nice it looks on the outside if it's all nasty on the inside. In fact, the inside is even more important to me. If it had a little smudge on the outside but it was nice and clean on the inside, I would say, well, I can, I can live with that. And so I use this simple visual to demonstrate the difference between religion and reality. Because religion is all obsessed with the outside. It's all about polishing the outside of the cup, so to speak. And the traditions of men uh, really tend to focus on that physical outside, right? When you think about many of the things that people think of as spiritual things, as important things to our, our spiritual life, well, people say, well, how does it look on the outside? Is it clean? Is it shiny? Is it, has it got a scripture on it? You know, things like that. Or to go, well, wow, that's, that, that's such a nice mug. It's such a nice man, such a nice person and polished to perfection. But again, the insight that God has, the inside insight, is that he knows the reality. He knows the reality of every person. He's not impressed by some polish on the outside. And there are times where he is actually very much impressed with the person on the inside. There's times in the scripture where it says he marveled and said, wow, now that's impressive. That's a reality right there. And again, by nature, human nature, we only see the outside. We only can. We might be able to talk about the inside. We might even be able to have a little bit of inside insight into ourselves. But even that is kind of distorted sometimes. And so God sees, again, the inside and the outside. And that's important for us to think about this morning. Washing the exterior doesn't really do anything that is going to impress God and rules and rituals that are outwardly imposed, right? And all of that can make us look righteous to one another, can fool somebody who's only looking at the outside. But God is not fooled by that, and neither should we be, really. And so the most important person not to fool is ourselves, right? 
when I think about this, I, I remember I was at a conference and a guy said, if anyone had lied to me as often as I've lied to me, I wouldn't be their friend. And I was like, what an amazing statement that is, because we can be pretty self deceiving sometimes. And so righteousness never, again, comes from the outside in. It can only come from the inside out. And so it's a God-given thing. When, when it comes to that, it's a grace. It's a thing that God pours in and puts into a person's life. And so no amount of outward conformity to something is really going to do what God came to do in our life. And it's on this very issue that Jesus wrestled constantly. The religious rulers of his day, uh, in Mark 7, he has another encounter with them. And, and I find it interesting that he wrestles with them, but we'll wrestle with this, right? Our own lives, as we look at God's word, as we look and allow it to speak to our hearts, to our inside, there has to be some form of wrestling with this. And it's not Again, something that I need to really focus on for everyone else. Oh, I want to get inside everybody's life and try to figure it out. No, it's probably enough of a challenge just simply to look and say, God, deal with my inside. And so that's the request I have as we look at verse 1. And you see it in Mark 7. It says, the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem, now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Now, again, I remind you that the, the title of the talk here, Inside Insight, is something that Jesus had in every person's life. So there were disciples. There were people who were following him. There were Pharisees and scribes. There were people who were following him for different reasons, right? And so... They came all the way from Jerusalem, and at least on an outward sense, that, that was like, wow, these are some pretty dedicated people. These are people coming a long way to do something. But what was it they came to do? Well, they came to be the inspectors of other people's lives, right? That's what they did. They came to show up and say, is somebody here not following a rule? Is somebody here not completing a ritual. See, it, it says they saw the disciples eat bread with defiled, unwashed hands, and they found fault. Now, I don't want to undo what your mom worked so hard to teach you, which is wash your hands before you eat, right? This is not what it, this is all about. This is not a question of whether you should or shouldn't wash your hands before you eat. Again, um, you know, we have some breakfast bread out there in the, in the foyer, and I would encourage you, the, the, the place to wash your hands is right there, especially me. I did wash my hands after I touched this junk in here, but now I've done it again. So uh, I will wash my hands before I go in there. But the the fault finding that they were doing was a religious fault finding. See, Jesus was very popular with the common folks, but he was disliked very actively by the religious elite, by the people who were better than others because they looked down on others, right? And so we see them again here in Mark 7, and they seemed to follow Jesus everywhere he went. And they were known as the Pharisees. The name actually means the separated ones, okay? What were they separating themselves from? People, uh, normal people, common people, you know, kind of dirty people. And so when you see the scribes, they were scripture scholars. They were people who would wash themselves almost compulsively, maybe compulsively, before they would write the scriptures. It, they would actually... They had this elaborate thing that they would go through and have to wear the right clothing and everything to hand write the scriptures because they held them in such high regard. But what's interesting is they weren't paying much attention to what they were pinning because the whole thing that they were supposed to be writing was talking about how they weren't right on the inside. So they would get all right on the outside and no ink stains and no smudges and anything and their penmanship was perfect. And yet, what they were supposed to be writing was about how a perfect God had come to imperfect people and said, I'm giving you grace. And somehow they wrote it every day and could memorize it and had done that, experts in the law, but they had forgotten the flaw, the flaw that was within them. And so in a society, they were held in high regard. They were looked at from the outside as, these are the good people. These are the great people. I could never really get their autograph because, wow, they're so important. 
They, they have all the great seats to everything. They have everything they need. And, you know, we're just the common people. But Jesus came to the common people. And, again, some of the VIPs didn't like that, that all of a sudden they were sitting in the normal seats. And they were like, wait a minute, why are we on the outside? We're insiders, right? <laughs> they didn't like that. And so the Pharisees and scribes were cup polishers, right? I said, uh, uh, that's what I was doing, was just polishing the cup. Jesus even used that analogy for him. He said, you're like people who clean the outside of the cup, but you don't care about the inside of the cup. You, your own life, you got the outside really shiny. Ooh, yeah. You know, and he said, it's like a, it's like a grave that's really well tended and flowers on it and everything, but inside you're like dead. There's a coffin in there and you're dead. You go, wow, those were strong words that Jesus was using to try to wake them up to what was going on. And when I talk about cup polishers, again, they had developed centuries of religious rituals, tons of layers of layers of layers of legalism to add on to the things that God had said for them to do to remind themselves that they needed God. Well, they, they actually added stuff so they no longer needed God. They had their own traditions and stuff. And so their religious life was based on these elaborate public performances. I mean, they were actors. They were actresses. They had long and loud public prayers. You know, they got the, the diction just right. You know, they had the rise and fall of their voice, and it just sounded so beautiful. And, and if they gave any, anything to God, they make sure the bell was ringing before they did it. Bing, 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 about to give, you know. And, and then the, everyone would watch and go, wow, they're so good. I could never be like them. And God says, I would never want you to be like them. Because they believed that cleanliness was godliness, right? Outward cleanliness was inward godliness. And their writings, we have them to this day, they contained hundreds of pages of the proper techniques for ceremonial washings. Oh, you didn't just wash your hands, you know, and scrub like this. And anyone in the medical field knows there's like the three things and it has it above the sink and it shows you how to do it right and stuff like that. It wasn't like this. There was like a 42 volume thing on how the water has to run exactly off this finger at this and all that. Very elaborate. Why? Because they found fault with others. And, you know, it's funny how psychology sometimes figures these things out over time, but did you know that sometimes people, the more obsessed they get with outward things, it's because of an inward guilt? It's because there's something in them that they're like trying to get rid of, and you, and you go, but you're dealing with it in a physical, but it's really an inward problem. See, in the verse 2 says they found fault with everyone else. Isn't this weird? These are all the things we come up with fancy words for, but like projection, where you put on someone else what's really on you. So you are eaten up with guilt, and you start criticizing other people. This is exactly what they did. And they're like, oh, your disciples are, are really bad people. They don't even read our books or do our rules and things. So they found fault with the outside of others. That's what you see in this. The inside insight that God's trying to give us here is that if, if you're obsessed with finding fault with others, man, God would want you to look, wait, 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 wait. Let me look here and see if God could deal with the inside of my cup instead of being so obsessed with what everyone else around me is doing wrong. And this is the interesting thing. They found no fault with their own insides. They're like, oh, I don't really think too much about that. See, I think I'm so obsessed with the outside, I never really think about what, how I'm doing on the inside or what's going on. Your cup is cleaner than my cup, so I gotta polish mine a little bit more before I go out in public. And you know, your outside is not as shiny as mine. You know, you have just a styrofoam cup, and look how cool my cup is. And that's, that was it, their whole life was comparison of the outsides, and they never really got to the inside questions. And so this group journeyed all the way from Jerusalem, think about that, to inspect Jesus and the disciples. You know, they were the giving them a, a score, you know, like you see in the, in the stores, you know, there. And I, they gave them like a 75%, not passing. We're condemning this. We are condemning this restaurant. It's not clean. And the Pharisees, again, found fault that God didn't. Isn't that interesting? He's, Jesus is right there eating with them, and Jesus wasn't criticizing them. And the critics were. Now, what I think is a, a tiny bit of conjecture, but might be interesting for you, if you think about the context, the last thing that happened was there was a miraculous provision of bread. 
And it says that the disciples took baskets for themselves, leftovers. So there's a very good chance, at least in my mind, that this bread that they were eating with unwashed hands was the very bread that Jesus had multiplied with the, the bread and fish in the previous chapter. It just happened. And so it says that they took the leftovers. And so here they are going, I can't believe he did a miracle. And instead of the Pharisees saying, tell us about this miracle, explain to us what happened, teach us these things, we need to know these things. And they said, did you wash your hands before you ate that miraculous bread? Wow, if it's truly that, this is a pretty interesting thing, a God-given miracle. And what are they seeing? Something that they miss the miracle completely. And so rather than responding in faith to Jesus as they could have, rather than having humility to realize that we never could do these things for people, we didn't meet people's needs, the Pharisees found fault. Why don't you do things like we do things? And of course, in our family, again, all the way along, we expected and asked the kids to wash their hands before and, and even, you know, in most cases after they eat. Because when kids eat, they eat so messy that by the end, their hands are, are going to get on the couch or whatever. You know, and I, Lynn knows she had three, three younger kids and then one older kid, me, because uh, I'm always the guy who's like, do you need a napkin? I'm like, no, that's what sleeps are for, you know, and stuff. But, but the washing that was, again, described here, you have to understand that don't, this isn't a, a manners, uh, you know, doesn't matter, matters don't, or manners don't matter message. It's not that. It was symbolic. It was ceremonial. It was that they weren't doing it right. It's not that they weren't clean. They were clean. They weren't clean in the eyes of a person who says, yes, but you skipped step number 42A and you didn't get it right. And so Mark elaborates that for us in verse 3 and verse 4 to make sure we understand it's not a major matter of hygiene. It's a matter of holier-than-thou-ness. The washing was done in a special way, taught by the tradition of man. It says there in verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, for there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. I love this one. Couches. I mean, the couches, this is like basically saying the places where they sit, right, to eat. And if somebody else sat on it before you sat on it, you got to get the cootie spray out. This is what the uh, you know, elders are saying. And it mentions the marketplace. Why does it mention the marketplace? Who's at the marketplace? Normal people. Unclean people. Probably people of different social status or spiritual elitism or maybe even racial differences. Maybe some Gentiles. <gasps> Gentiles were the lowest of the low for them, and you might actually check out next to one at the market. Oh, oh, unthinkable. And so when you came back from that market, you had better scrub, scrub, scrub to make sure that any dust from somebody else was off of your body. And again, I'm not making this stuff up. You can go look and see that the ritual washings of these Pharisees and these public pronouncements and everything, these were the things Jesus talked about and said, like, man, you, you guys forget. <laughs> I see the inside insight. And I'm not so worried about that dirty guy next to you as I'm worried about the dirt inside you that would think you so much better simply because you've had a more recent shower than that person. You see, it's that everyone's a sinner except I'm not. I'm righteous because I went through the ritual and you didn't. And again, uh, we had cootie spray when I was growing up. And if a girl sat in a chair before you did, you had to, you know, spray for cooties. And, and the message, again, was a comparison message of I, I'm something that you're not. And, and you're just bad because of who you are. Right? And they came to find fault with Jesus. And again, the human traditions would focus on the outside. 
But divine truths, if you ever want to try to figure out the difference between the two, divine truth always focuses on the inside. And though God often used illustrations from the outside, the point was trying to get to the inside. So somebody left it there, and he would use uh, certain classifications in the Old Testament and say, this is a clean food, this is an unclean food. This for you is good, this for you is bad. Touch this, don't touch that. And God was trying to use physical illustrations for his people because they weren't yet mature enough to understand the underlying thought behind it. So God, had, why do we not eat that? Because God has said, don't eat that. And that could be enough. But again, there's a, right here in many other places, Jesus said, New Testament, new covenant, new understanding, full revelation of what I was trying to show you. He says, all foods are clean. I wasn't talking about food as the thing. I was talking about listening to God for what is and what is not a part of your heart and a part of your life. See, and I love this because the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashed hands? Now, they thought they had Jesus big time on this because it was elder worship, right? It was the godly guys who came before us are the people we worship right? We really hold them in high regard. And why don't you walk according to tradition, right? And Jesus did not directly answer the question. He asked another question of them. He knew that they were hypocrites. He knew that their insides were rotten. And so he addressed the issue with them by quoting the scripture. And he said, well, verse six, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lip, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. You wash the pitcher and the cup, and a lot of other stuff like that you do. I love it. Jesus is like, I'm not even going to go into it because I'd be here all day. You do lots of stuff like that, etc., etc., etc. is kind of what he says. You know, do I need to elaborate? And so the religious rulers were great at judging Jesus and his followers for something that was not even God-given. They even admitted it. They said, it's according to the tradition of our forefathers. Why don't you do it? And Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah to basically said, your forefathers were just as big a hypocrites as you were. He, Isaiah in his day had to deal with them, and I in my day am dealing with you. So it wouldn't be too big a surprise that the apple didn't fall for too far from the tree. They were hypocrites, you're hypocrites, and here we are. And so when you think about what a hypocrite is, it's kind of interesting. If you've seen the Greek um, theater masks, you know that in a lot of theaters, they have them. They have the happy mask and the sad mask, and they're those two little things that are a representation of theater. That's because in Greek theater, what they would do is they would hold up a mask in front of their face to show what their different emotions were, and that's how they did it. It was kind of a combined uh, you know, puppet show almost type of thing. And so that was known as a hypocrite, a mask wearer. If somebody said, what are you going to be when you grow up? They'd say, a hypocrite. Oh, that's great. You're going to go into acting. That's what it meant. It wasn't necessarily a negative term in its original use. It was, uh, you wear a mask, a hypocrite, a person who wears an outward thing that shows what's going on. But Jesus now uses it in a thing saying, when you apply this to a human heart, when you apply this to a relationship with God, when you, you know, apply this to spirituality, well, anyone who's wearing a mask has missed what it was all about. Because again, lips that honor God and dishonor him on the inside, he's saying, you can wear the happy face on the outside, but if you're the, you know, bitter, angry person on the inside, God knows the inside insight. He sees past the mask. However good an actor or actress you are, he's not saying, well, you fooled me. You had me. Wow, you, I really bought into your character. He's saying, I know your character. I don't care if you're an actor. I'm not going to look at that and go, well done. Well done. Uh, you, you got me. And again, the main issue was the heart. He says, your heart is far from me. 
And again, when I think about that, one of the strange things about life is that people tend to have the message hit them that shouldn't and miss them that shouldn't. And what do I mean by that? If I were to today teach a message on the importance of church attendance, you know who would hear it? The people who are here. You know who don't hear it? The people who aren't. So people are here and they go, oh, you're right. I should attend more often. He's talking to me. No, I'm not talking to you. What's funny is that hypocrites... If you talk about hypocrisy, you know who doesn't you generally have that hit their heart? Hypocrites. You know who, who does start feeling bad? The sensitive souls. The people who really actually do respond to God, they're like, oh, I'm such a hypocrite. No. Let me tell you something that's so important to think on. Again, the disciples, were they perfect? No, they weren't perfect. They were bums. Can I, can I put it that way? I mean, Jesus picked imperfect people they were messed up they were constantly you know bickering and fighting with each other they were far far short of God's glory just like everyone was but the difference was <laughs> there was a reality to their following of Jesus so when he was talking about hypocrites he wasn't talking to Peter although Peter was <laughs> had problems James and John had problems Judas, well, he was a hypocrite among them. Yes, that's true. But he was talking to this group of people, and I've thought about it so many times that, again, there's a little hypocrisy in each of us. There's a, a, a tendency toward it in anyone. But to elevate the traditions of the outside versus the elevation of the truth inside is really the issue. And I wrote this down, and I hope it helps you if you think about it, which is that hypocrisy happens. When the outside ritual grows and the inside reality slows and you don't care. In fact, you're happy for it to be that way. See, it's not that there's a gap. Of course there's a gap. There's a gap between me and Jesus and there always will be a gap between me and Jesus. But if I try to make up for that by pretending to be something I'm not, by hiding the struggles that I have inside by trying to trick everybody I meet into thinking, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm as perfectly polished on the inside as I am on the outside, where I say, listen, man, there's the reality. God's working on me. He's working on us together. And so I think about this. The fact that there is a gap is just reality. But if that gap is growing and I try to cover that up by pretending to be more pious than I really am. That's the issue. That's what Jesus really talked about. We become hypocrites when we pay more attention and care more about our reputation than our reality. And I, I don't care if my character is shrinking and I'm actually, I'm playing the hero in the play. I'm really a villain inside. Well, that's the whole issue. And carefully following Religious practices while allowing our heart to remain apart from God. And this is a biggie too. You saw it, the fault finding. I always look at it in my life. I say, am I starting to find fault with everyone? And I never find fault with myself. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm emphasizing my virtues and I'm emphasizing everyone else's faults. Oh man, that's a bad sign. I'm headed in the wrong direction. So that's when you tell God, you know what? I don't care what people think of whether I look shiny. I need you to clean the inside of me. I need you to deal with this. And when somebody's doing that, the fact that there's still work for God to do, we are his workmanship. He's, we're created in Christ until the day of Christ where he will be cleansing the inside of the cup. So the fact that there's a gap shouldn't concern anyone. The fact that you recognize there's a gap actually is a good sign. But if that gap grows and the outward things just grow and grow and grow and you're doing more of that to try to cover up and, deal, uh, and, and pretend that there isn't a problem on the inside, that's when there's a problem on the inside. So Jesus quoted the scriptures and the Pharisees knew them by heart. Isn't that funny? He's like, uh, you're asking me why I don't do what I do. I, let, let's go to the scriptures and ask you why don't you don't do what you do. This was not a new problem. It had gone all the way back. It will always be here. There will always be those situations because it's very 
easy, actually. This is why I, I, I think on it, Jesus is about to tell you it's easier to clean the outside of something than the inside. That's the thing. You can pressure wash the outside of something fairly quickly. You can do a broad brush thing and make it look pretty good on the outside. I, you know, I've seen it many times that people will uh, restore a car <laughs> and all they do really is paint over it. They just, sh and, and man, it fools most people. They're like, that's amazing. I always take a magnet with me anytime I purchase a car. Why? Because cars, most cars are made out of metal. They're supposed to be. And magnets stick to metal. And it's amazing how glossy a paint job can look and you put the magnet to it and all of a sudden the magnet just falls off in the middle of the car and you're like oh wow this was done in a way that it's just a cover-up it's just a cover-up and and this is what Jesus says verse 9 all too well you reject the commandment of God that you keep the tradition isn't that interesting they reject one thing and accept something else why because traditions are actually easy how much what do I need to do well do three of these two of those and one of those okay whoo I'm done listen Becoming Christ-like in character, you're never done. I am never done. I'm not like, okay, well, I did three uh, good deeds. I'm done. I'm more like Jesus. You know, like infinitesimally small accomplishment, <laughs> enormous gap still between what God wants to do in my life. So it's actually far easier for me to think if I just do this or give that or, or, or check off a box, I'm done. This is what Moses said, honor your father and mother. Who, whoever curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, verse 11, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received to me is Corban, that is a gift to God, you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you've handed down. And many such things you do. I mean, here again is Jesus saying, I'm just picking one example out of so many that even if you argue with me on this one, we could just go on and on about the subject. The point is the same, that tradition and truth, they don't always intersect. And in fact, what traditions generally are done is to make it so I don't have to obey the difficult truth. Truth hard, tradition easy. So let me overlay a nice little thin layer of tradition over the top of a difficult, deep truth and I'm done. <sighs> he says, but you're not done. See, one of the Ten Commandments was honor your father and mother. Isn't that interesting? That was God given. And here's what they did. Here's what they did. They basically said, man, that's, that's pretty tough. Here's what we want to do. We want to find a way to honor ourselves instead of our parents, but we want it to make it look like we're honoring God. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty clever. I've often been impressed with people's clever ways of, you know, working around God's truth. And so this is what they did. They came up with a solution. They call it here Corbin. Let me explain to you what that was traditionally. It was an ingenious way of breaking God's law, blaming God for why you weren't being obedient to God's law. The word means given or dedicated, a gift to God. So here's what they would do. A person, let's say a person had means to help somebody else. What they would do is they would dedicate those goods to God. They would dedicate it and call it Corbin. It was, it was a thing. It was, uh, oh, this is set aside for God. Sorry, I can't help you with that. And so it was just a ritual. They would go through this ritual. They would pay a part of it to the priest. And now it's designated Corbin. Can't touch it. It's dedicated to God. Um, so I get to keep it and use it. I can use it because I'm get dedicated to God, but I can't help you with it. So um, it's already been used. And so a person's parent had need, right? They had a need. And uh, sorry, Dad, can't help. Why? Because, well, you know, I dedicated it to God. Uh, yeah, I'm using it, but you can't use it. And you go, what? That, even listening to that, you go, who would believe this? Somebody who wanted to believe it. So they didn't have to do what God had told them to do. He'd made it so clear what to do. And so the whole point, again, is that anytime you see a tradition, it's going to wrap something that sounds super spiritual. Oh, he's so dedicated. He dedicated his entire entirety of his, of his earnings to God in Corbin, which means I don't have to give it to any needy people. <laughs> it's really nice, but I'm doing it for God. Are all traditions wrong? No, but you have to scoop through them and say, where's the truth? 
Where's the truth? What's the real outcome of this? What's the real reason behind this? And Jesus was so good at stripping away all of that and saying, like, when you do your good, don't do it in such a way that everyone goes, wow, you're really good. He said, do it in a way that only God knows, because God knows the inside insight anyway. He knows why you did it. And the bottom line is, if you did it for the wrong reason, don't do it, because you've already received a reward from men, and they don't reward you anyway. So, you know, when you think about that, and if you're doing it for the human pat on the back, most of those come with a, a knife in them anyway. So what's the point? He says, if you're going to do something, do it for God. God will reward you. He'll see what's done in secret, and he'll reward you openly. So when you think about how God does things with his truths, he goes for the deeper things. He goes for the underneath things. He goes for the inside story, because that's what he sees anyway. And so... The upside of this, this is where I really want to focus on as, as, we, as we go our way, which is the upside, which is that God's work can't be hidden. He's, he does an inside job first. He really does an inside work in a person's life, and it will go to the outside. Like if I were to completely clean the inside of this cup right now, if I were to take time to do that, guess what? The outside's going to be clean too. It's going gonna, it's gonna to spill over. It'd be really hard for me to keep it dirty on the outside, but, but clean it all real nice on the inside. Right? It's, it's just going to happen. It's part of what's happening with the overflow of cleaning it. So God works on the inside from the inside out but he can't be hidden and this is what he talks about in the next section see the the pharisees were told in verse 8 many other things you do your your external stuff is all about that but he said god doesn't do that many other things god's going to do he's going to work on the inside and it's going to make it to the outside see when he called the multitudes to himself look at this verse 14 he calls the multitudes to himself. He said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand there's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. That was a one sentence, you know, rewrite of the entire Old Testament ceremonial system right there. Boom. He's like, what? What about all those things about you can't have shellfish and stuff like that? And he's like, I was trying to teach you not to be selfish with your shellfish, but I wasn't telling you you couldn't have shellfish. So anyway, the, you look at verse 15, there's nothing that enters you from the outside that defiles you. The things that come out of you, these are the things that are defiling. If anyone has ears to hear that, hear that. And again, he turned their whole world inside out and upside down. You can, you can just picture the scribes and, and the Pharisees saying, this is my world burning. Their entire religious system had become so external with the rituals and routines and the, and the careful uh, keeping of all of this. Well, it's, on Friday, I can't do this, and on Saturday, I do that, and, and, and I look down on anyone who's doing that, and I'm following you in the fields, and I saw you eat that grain and all that stuff. And they thought they were so clean and clear with God because they were so much better better than all the people who didn't obsess on all of this stuff. And Jesus says, actually, you guys are closer to the truth who realize, I think I can eat it if I'm hungry, right? And if I give half to you, I'm on my way, right? And Jesus says, yeah, nothing that enters a man from the outside defiles him i could eat physical dirt and it doesn't make me spiritual dirty i don't know that it's a great idea you know sometimes when people say natural flavors i'm like dirt is natural um <laughs> you know only natural flavors uh, well this is only natural flavors i still not sure i want to eat it but it may be a bad idea from a nutritional perspective you may be allergic to it or something but the the whole idea that there's a spiritual component to what and when you eat what and when you eat. It's like Jesus says, can I just wipe that out of your mind real quickly and say that you are no better or worse than someone because you uh, did eat or didn't eat fish on Friday all those years? No amount of washing on the outside did anything to remove the inside defilement. And this is what he's trying to say. He's just showing them in a simple way that they could all understand. But boy, they were going to have to wrestle with it. You see it in the book of Acts. Peter was still wrestling with it because when Jesus tells him, go ahead and have some, uh, some of the pulled pork, he's like, no, Lord, I have never touched non-kosher anything. And he says, 
I was trying to teach you that when I say it's okay, it's okay. And you were actually saying people were clean and unclean. And I have just told you that the Gentiles, I've cleansed them. And you can go eat with them. And you can cross over there because of the cross. I've wiped all that out. You are both sinners in need of the same grace. And this was such a mind-blowing thing because tradition dies hard. And truth Travel slow sometimes, slowly. You can take a bath 15 times a day. It's not going to cleanse you. You could respond to every outward symbol of spiritual change. And unless your heart is changing, it doesn't matter. And so when you think about this, verse 17, he entered a house away from the crowd and his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, are you without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside can't defile him? It doesn't enter his heart, but his stomach. He gives him a little, you know, anatomy lesson. He says it, it's eliminated. It, it, your body processes things, physical things through the stomach. But he says, but it's your mind and your heart that I'm seeing. And it's an inside thought. It was such a radical principle that even the disciples were having trouble really understanding it. But rather than reject him, they actually stayed close to him and kept asking. They're like, I, I just don't get it. I, I, I'm, I'm troubled, you know. And these did, you know, all through Leviticus and all this. There were health reasons to it, you know. The special processing of some of these things that we know now how to keep it from making you sick. They didn't know how to make it uh, do that back then. And so there were things that God just said. Out in the desert, don't eat that. Why? Because I'm God. God didn't say, well, let me tell you a little something about E. coli. Uh, he didn't discuss it. But isn't it interesting that every kid in the world right now is like, salads are deadly. You know, I, I, I remember somebody once telling me, you never heard of anyone dying from mad broccoli disease. Um, you know, someone was trying to build the case for different dietary things. And I'm like, well, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but you see now... There, Anything can be troublesome to your body physically. Anything can be cleansed. Acts 10, Galatians, books of the Bible go into deep understanding of these things. Food goes into the stomach. It's physical. Outward things are outward. Inward things are inward. And Jesus said, what it comes out of a man, that defiles him from within, out of the heart of men. Verse 21, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Notice it's plural. I love that. Thefts covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. See, anyone who thinks that they're basically good, that humans are basically good, has never read the Bible and never been honest with themselves. You know, again, when you spend time around kids, you realize you don't have to train them to be terrible, right? You're not like, if I can just get them to terrible by two, they'll be right on track, right? You're like, no, they're so cute, but it's good they're cute, and it's good they're small because their hearts overflow with all of these things, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you think about it. He's saying, he puts them in plural. There's more than one way to commit these crimes. You know, if you've had the attitude, you've had the action because God sees the inside insight. He's like, when you say, oh, bless your heart, that's the outside, but God's like, I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. And again, when you, when you say that, it actually can free you. It can free you because, yeah, I'm not saying whatever ugliness is inside us, let's let it out all the time. That's not really the point. The point is, again, that Jesus can't be hidden, and we don't have to hide what's inside from him especially. We can just say, you know what? <sighs> There's not a lot of blessing in my heart right now. And from there he arose and went to the Tyre and Sidon region, you know, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. This is what I wrote down again. He can't be hidden. If you have Jesus inside, he can't be hidden. He's going to bust out. Even in those times where he's like, you know, I'm just going to someone's house. This is not a public performance this is not a public appearance now appearing Jesus at such and such house it's just kind of like no matter where he went people were drawn to him why because he was a guy who knew everything 
and liked you anyway. See, I remember something from my grandmother's fridge, which is where all good theology lives. And my grandmother's fridge had a magnet, and it said, a friend is someone who knows all about you and likes you anyway. And I thought, yeah, isn't that true? I mean, Jesus knows the most about me and cares the most about me. So why is it that I'm so obsessed with impressing people with an outside that I'm probably not even fooling them? Because <laughs> we, we think we're better at fooling people than we really are. And they don't even like me. What, why do I care so much? And so what he's trying to do is free us. That's the upside to the inside, insight, which is, guess what? The guy who knows all about you, he can't be hidden but you don't have to hide your inside from him because you couldn't even if you wanted to. Think about what happened in, in the book of Genesis. It says they, they hid from God behind a tree he made, right? They're like, oh, we knew we'd messed up, so we're hiding. Where are you? He's like, hide and seek behind the tree. Like, God can't see that. They, they put on a fig leaf, which is a very scratchy leaf, by the way, and that's the, they're hiding in the, behind the tree, behind a fig leaf, and God's like, I kind of know you naked, right? I can see all. I, 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 you don't have to hide. And so we'll just stop there. Verse 24, Jesus was in the house, but he couldn't be hidden. When he's in your heart, he can't be hidden. And when you're, he's in your heart, you don't have to hide your heart anymore. You don't have to live behind a mask anymore. You don't have to pretend to be more godly than you are because God knows how godly you are. And he knows that any godly that you are is the result of his work in your life. And so I can just say more of you and less of me, you know, and let me not worry so much about shining up the outside of the cup to impress the people who aren't impressed anyway because they're so obsessed with the inside of, of, or outside of their own cup. And they're criticizing the one flaw that they see anyway, you know. Especially being around high schoolers, this is something I've learned. They will find your flaw. They will find your flaw. I can remember being back in high school. If you had big ears, you were going to know about it. And you were going to make sure that every, ki every kid would come to you, oh, hey, big ears, what's up? You know, and whatever else. It's just the way they are. And so now being back there as an adult, it's so interesting because you see that they're they walk into a room and they're thinking about themselves and they think everyone else is thinking about themselves, but everyone in the room is thinking about themselves. And you say, but, but it's all outside. It's, it's all, oh, oh, oh no, I'm thinking about this and nobody's thinking about that. And God, you know, in, in some small way as an adult who cares about these kids, God gives you the inside insight too, where you just, as an adult now, I know there, there's things that they make fun of me. The kids make fun of me. They make fun of me. If, if, if there's anything out of place, they will make sure that they let you know. But you know what? Now I can come with the confidence. I'm like, I'm not cool. And I know I'm not cool. I'm not trying to be cool. Uh, I don't even need to be. I'm not trying to impress a bunch of high schoolers, right? And I'm not impressed by a bunch of high schoolers. What I can do instead is look at them and say, you know what? A kid has a heart. And there was a situation the other day where there was something going on, and I, and I was like, you know what, though? I think they're the right choice, and you know why? Let's all admit it. There's something about that kid's heart. They, they're trying. They're, God is working on them. You can see it. And yes, they're in our office more often than all the rest. <sighs> but the inside insight that God wants to give each of us is to look back past that and say well if you look at yourself you realize you got some work to do too and God's working on all of us through that and he's cleansing the cup on the inside and the out and that is a very freeing way to live it's a very free way to live to know that God has the inside insight and loves me anyway so God I pray that you would do uh, that work in us this week uh, that we would uh, just have a, a an understanding that everyone we look at uh Maybe they're finding fault with us. Maybe we're finding fault with them. Maybe they're finding the wrong kind of fault with themselves, looking inside and saying, oh, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. And, and you instead would want to give grace to the inside. You, you want to fill a life so full of grace that there's no place for all the rest of that. It just drives it out. It just cleans from the inside out. We're so full that we don't have to worry about so many of those things. And God, I pray that you would give us uh, lab sessions in this, that we would be able to look past somebody's outside 
and have the inside insight that you would provide. We pray it in Jesus' name.